Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig, it's 12 o'clock on a Sunday. It's time for a Q&A. This is where I take all the questions that you've asked over the course of the week and I try to answer them to the best of my ability. Um, so please ask as many questions as you can in the comments down below. Please leave all the questions you want me to answer in this video. There are so many comments on this channel now. If they're dotted around on different videos, I don't always see them, to be perfectly honest. Um, but there's some amazing questions this week, uh, and I think it's going to be really cool. So without further ado, let's have a look at the first question. Right, so the first question is by Mitch Kof, I think that is. Hey, Mitch, how you doing? And uh, he says, Craig, I have a question. What are your real, true, open and honest feelings towards the former company, Sands Mines? Well, what do I think of Sands Mines? I think that they are not very good, to be perfectly honest. I think that they have released some absolute garbage. And when I say garbage, I mean complete and total garbage. I think that they are the quintessential perfect example of a company that is more interested in the bottom line and how much money they can make than they are in actually um, the, the, uh, the actual magic itself. I think that they care hardly anything about the magic and they care more about the uh, the, the, the product it, it, itself they care about the money that that's what i think um a lot of the tricks that they release um they release with a gimmick and they proudly say hey this requires a gimmick whilst in reality it never did require a gimmick it was just basically oh it's a piece of tape and it's a it's a piece of uh, cotton and that's that's what you get inside the box and this is what you're going to do with it uh, a lot of their products did not actually come with a gimmick it could have been sold a lot cheaper as a download and i've heard and i don't know if that's the case but i've heard that that's what they used to do they used to sell them as a download and then after that they used to sell them off to magic shops as an actual physical product by throwing a couple of bits and pieces in there um I, yeah their tricks are terrible i remember trip i remember egyptian ink which looks fantastic on the trailer i mean it looks absolutely amazing and when you buy it i mean it is just the worst trick ever it would not fool a blind monkey it is an absolutely terrible trick and and i don't know who they've got but i think they're I think that, they, that when they were around, they were just trying to get as many products in as possible. And I think people would submit stuff and they'd be going, yeah, 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 we'll, we'll sell that, we'll sell that. Now, occasionally they came up with a hit. And I think if you throw enough crap against the wall, sometimes some of it's going to hit. Some of the stuff that Nicholas Lawrence did with them was absolutely amazing. Um, uh, the, the vanishing ring box is actually really good. Uh, the self-lighting lighter is actually really good. They have got some good stuff. But unfortunately, for every good product that there was, there were 10 products that were, were terrible. And uh, I didn't like the instructions, the, 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 the way that they delivered the instructions. I didn't like the tricks. Um, I didn't like the way they marketed themselves. I didn't like their trailers. I think their trailers were very dishonest. I didn't like a lot about that company, to be perfectly honest. So, yeah, I, I don't really know what's happened to them. I know they're not around anymore. I know that they've rebranded or changed their name uh, or something. I don't know. Um, but the original Sands Mines, which is what your question was about, I really didn't like them at all. Okay, so the next question is by J. Kelly7. Hey, J. Kelly7, how you doing? And this question is, what would you recommend as the best starter DVD or book for someone looking to get into coin magic? I know plenty of moves, but not many solid routines to practice. Well, let's, let's take DVDs first of all. I honestly think that the absolute best way to learn coin magic is by going for the easy to master coin magic series by Michael Amar. A lot of newer magicians aren't aware of this, but the stuff that Michael Amar put out back in the day is absolutely brilliant. And, and what he did, if you've never seen these before, and you can still get them as downloads, but what, what he did is he did three DVDs worth of uh, not just coin magic, but money magic. And he put it all on, uh, he, he, he took routines with the permission of creators from lots of different creators and he put sets together with these tricks. So he would have a set of like three or four money tricks, then another set of three or four money tricks and he routined the, the stuff together. So it wasn't just kind of, here's a trick, this is how it's done. Here's a trick, this is how it's done. Here's a trick, this is how it's done. It's more of a case of, hey, here's a selection of three tricks. And you can see how he transitioned from one trick into another, how he hooked the audience in in between six. What happened during that transition period, how he got into and out of each trick. 
which is really, really valuable. The instruction, because it's Michael Amar, was second to none. And he even had this sort of super practice session where it was an over-the-shoulder camera shot and it was all to classical music and it was just going through the key moves. There is no better way to learn coin magic. And you've got a very eclectic range of tricks on there. You've got the Cross of India by Daryl, which is brilliant. You've got, uh, you learn the Hang Ping Chen, you learn finger palm, you learn retention passes. And also he, he actually put on there his coins through silk, which is one of the most beautiful routines ever. If you've not seen it, it's got sort of a see-through chevron silk and he has three silver dollars. There's no extras, there's no gimmicks. He puts the coins inside and one at a time they come out. And because it's see-through, you can see the coins are in there and you can see them com coming out one at a time. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, other sources to learn coin magic from, uh, if you're wanting to learn routines. I get from your question, you're saying here that you, you know a lot of moves, but not many solid routines. So what you need is you need routines, right? Which is why I'd recommend the Michael Amar stuff. Um, but other things, it, it, it's um, anything by David Roth is good. Uh, in fact, I would recommend David Roth, um, Mike Gallo, um, Jeff Latter, and uh, Michael Rubenstein put together a series of DVDs. I think there's like 17 or 18 DVDs, and I think they're now available as a download. And it was like the New York Coin Guys. And I know the first one was on Coins Across, but they did a whole bunch of DVDs on different things. Um, copper, silver, Coins Across. They did some on shells. They did some on penetrations, transpositions. It's amazing. And it's all tricks. And, and some of the tricks are by Jeff. Some of the tricks are by uh, Mike. Some of the tricks are, you know, they, they all present their own different tricks. It's sad to think that two of the people that are on those DVDs have now passed away. Unfortunately, we've lost... We've We've lost Jeff Latter and we've lost David Roth, um, but the the material on there will live on forever. So that's an, if you if you've got a bit of money to burn and you want to have a lot of material that you will be studying for a very long time, that is a great thing to look at. And if you want more ideas for routines, look at Jay Sankey's revolutionary coin magic. A lot of people don't think of Jay as a coin magician because he's done so much. But when I first started watching Jay Sankey, he was like a coin guy. And he came up with some ridiculously complicated sleight of hand with coins that were completely different to anything else that people were doing back then. And he put a lot of that on revolutionary coin magic. I think there's a revolutionary coin magic number two as well. But his coin magic set is absolutely amazing. Um, the other place that I would go and look if you want routines is Rune Klan, who is one of my favorite magicians of all time. Rune Klan put out a video years ago that recently, or a couple of years ago, Vanishing Ink have re-put out. It's called Three Pieces of Silver. And it's a whole bunch of routines with just three half dollars. And he did it in like a fake restaurant setting. Um, so you can actually see how he approaches a restaurant uh, table and how he actually does this. And some of the moves and some of the routines are quite knacky. They're quite difficult to do, but if you want something aspirational, that's a great DVD to look at. So that should give you enough on the DVDs. Books, if you can find it, get Kaufman's um, Richard's Elmanyak, which is absolutely brilliant. You also want to get Coin Magic by Richard Kaufman. You want to get Expert Coin Magic by David Roth, also by Richard Kaufman, uh, uh, Kaufman and Greenberg. And, and if you... Um, get uh, Michael Rubenstein's new book as well, because there's so many routines in there. I will say, with coin magic, a lot of the time it's easier to learn through video than it is uh, written down, but those books are absolutely brilliant. They really are, and they're so well described, the routines in there. Um, yeah, so that's a lot of a lot of stuff to get you going. I did a video recently, uh, I did a five by five on the, uh, on the channel, and it was a coin magic special, and I performed and explained five routines that uh, you should learn first when you're first getting into coin magic. And I, I cited sources as to where you can learn that material as well. So it might be worth having a look at that five by five if you get a spare few minutes. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're doing the right thing by getting into coin magic because it really sets you apart from those guys that just go out and do card tricks. Okay, so the next question is by Mr. Harmon and he says, for virtual magic, does it have to be interactive? Well, no, I suppose not. Um, I suppose it doesn't have to be interactive. I mean, you could literally just perform and just, just, it depends on what you mean by interactive, because there's two ways that a virtual show is interactive. 
The first way that a virtual show is interactive is by getting them to do something at their end. So, for example, you're seeing a lot of virtual magic tricks that are coming out at the moment where they've got a deck of cards and you've got a deck of cards and they're kind of doing something at their end and it ends up, you know, there's a virtual rising card and a virtual triumph and a virtual card match and all this different stuff. Um, that's one way of doing an interactive show. The other way of doing an interactive show is by... Um, interacting in terms of getting the audience that are watching uh, to interact, but without actually getting them on screen to do something. So, for example, um, you know, you might be doing a two in the hand, one in the pocket, and you might say, right, I've got three, uh, I've got three coins here. If I put two in my hand and I put one in my pocket, guys, I want you to tell me how many coins there are in my hand. Hold up your fingers. Let me know. I want to see how many people get this. Okay, right. see, and most people have put up two fingers. It's three. It's actually, I didn't tell you. It's called the three coin trick. I tell you what, we'll do it again. It's called the three coin trick. Um, that's another way of making it interactive that doesn't necessarily doing it. It's, it's not interactive in that they're following along back at their end, but it's still interactive. Now, I a lot of the time when I'm doing my virtual show, I do the second type of interaction. So I don't specifically have them do something at their end that uh, they have to kind of follow along with me. I do sometimes, depending on the show, depending on the client, depending on what the brief is, sometimes I do, but a lot of the time I won't do it and I'll just make it interactive in other ways. Um, but I do really think that you need to make it interactive. The key thing about having a virtual show is that you can see everybody, you can see their reactions and they can see you. So because you can see them and they can see you, you can make it very observational. And that's one of the things that I like doing. I like making it observational by pointing out different stuff because that's my style. So it's like, uh, um, hi there guys, my name's Craig, I'm a magician. I hope you're having a great night. Uh, I'm going to be, uh, you know, and, and then just kind of commenting on something. Like, let's say I've just sold a Rubik's Cube. Well, you right there, David, your eyes almost just dropped out of their sockets. I think that Dave was very, very impressed there. Dave's giving me a thumbs up. Thank you very much, Dave. Really appreciate it. And everyone else is laughing. Thing because even though they can't see the reaction that Dave has done, I'm vocalizing it to everybody. Um, and if they all know each other, it, it makes it very, very funny in that way. So you can be very observational with virtual shows. If you're not being observational at all and you're not trying to get the audience at the other end to interact with you, you may as well just do a pre-recorded video and just hit play um, because it's basically the same thing, right? So I think that the advantage of a virtual show is making it interactive. And there's so many different ways that you can actually do that these days there's so many different options in terms of uh, and I'm adding new stuff all of the time so I do a Rubik's Cube thing in my virtual show because it's so visual right it, it is super visual when you take a Rubik's Cube and solve it right in front of the screen they love it and what I've done recently I do uh, I do a, a routine with four Rubik's Cubes it's called Cubism and uh, and one thing that I did before I get uh, when you do cubism, you get the audience member, you get a member of the audience to to count from one to sixty while you're blindfolded, right? And um, one thing that I how I always used to do this is I never used to put them on screen. I used to just do the cubism routine, and they would just the people could hear them, but they couldn't see them. And, and what I've done recently when I'm doing cubism is I'm actually putting them on the screen so that people can see the person who's, uh, who's going one, two, three. And that's really improved the trick a million percent because people can see, I was worried that they wouldn't see me, but you can have two people spotlighted and they can still see me perfectly well and they can still see what I'm doing. But you see the other guy as well and when, when the trick works at the end and you see the reaction, people freak out with it, they really do. And, and a lot of the time, <coughs> they're reacting to the person that I've spotlighted on the screen that's watching me. So, I'm tinkering with it all the time, but that's a very long-winded way to say yes, I think that when you're doing a virtual show, you want to make it interactive because that's the beauty of that medium. Hope that makes sense. Right, so the next question is more of a statement, but I'm going to address it anyway. Uh, it's by uh, Gaffman, and Gaffman says, I love the Dowden DVD Party Animal. Uh, I love the Dowden DVD set Party Animal. For me, the best DVD. Watched it over 10 times. So much great workers for walk around. Totally agree. Um, it's an older DVD now, and I haven't heard or seen from Matthew Dowden for years. If anybody knows where he is, let me know in the comments down below. After this DVD, it just seemed to disappear from the magic community, which is a big shame. Um, but uh, Matthew Dowden, if you haven't seen it, 
party animal is probably one of the if not the best dvds on close-up magic i've ever seen there are so many routines that are absolutely wonderful he does this repeat card in mouth where they're picking a card and it goes in the mouth and it goes in the mouth again and it goes in the mouth and then the deck disappears when you put it in the mouth. So cool. Uh, he does a multi-phase card, uh, card in pocket, which is an amazing card in pocket. I think I mentioned that on last week's Q&A. He, um, he does an amazing card at any number as well. I mean, there's so much really strong commercial material. And, and he, he had a lot of work on the one-handed palm. He could do a one-handed palm brilliantly. And he had the idea of, if you've never seen it, it's brilliant, but he's got the, uh, the deck of cards and he's got a little stick man that he draws on the, uh, on the top card of the deck. And you, you know, the audience doesn't know this, but underneath the top card of the deck, you've got a little stick man. And what he does is he shows this drawing of a stick man and he holds the deck and he throws like that. And as he does, he does a one-handed top palm and what happens is, as he does the one-handed top palm, the, the stick man that's underneath the top card flies out onto the table. And, and obviously that card ends up going into his palm and it looks like trick photography. It looks like a little stick man just flies off the top of the card. It looks amazing, it really does. And, and there's a million routines like that. If you've not seen Party Animal, go out of your way to beg, borrow, or steal a copy because it is one of the best DVDs ever published on Close Up Magic. Okay, so the next question is by Zane Lantz, I think it is, Zane Lance. I think I've butchered your name and I'm very sorry. Uh, the question is, how do you keep your coin collection organised? Any recommendations for bringing them with you day to day and keeping gimmicks organised? I have um, um, in my office, I, I don't know if you've seen these pillbox type things where it's kind of like probably the size of a close-up mat and uh, it's like a see-through box and you open it up and it's got like space for lots of different pills and stuff like that but not like the little straight ones that you get ones that are like as big as a close-up mat and you open them up and it opens up into sort of two sections there's a big section at the bottom and then there's smaller little drawers that are organized well i've got like four of those and i have all of my coins in different sections and i have one for loose random coins and loose random gimmicks if it's a really expensive set like like a half dollar shell set or a jamie schoolcraft set i have them in individual purses and then i put the purses inside the uh in inside the relevant sections and then what i have on the top is i put little stickers um, <laughs> so that as I open it and I write on the stickers what's in each section inside the purses. So when I open it up, I can I can look for the right box. And when I open it up, right, okay, there's there's my Morgan Dollar flipper set number one. Open there it is. Right, brilliant. That's what I'm going to do. And so I have all of that. I have all of these coins basically set up in there. So I have four of these pill boxes that are just on the shelf. And I have all of this stuff in there. So if I'm ever working on a new routine and I think, right, okay, I need a, uh, I need a sun and moon coin for this. I'll just go over there, open up, a sun and, uh, open up, find a sun and moon coin. I, I think I'm going to need two regular coins for this as well. Okay, that's there and there. Boom. Right. Let's work on the routine, whatever it may be. So that keeps me really organized. And if there's a particular routine that I do a lot um, I will have it set up. So I do the stone purse by Nate Cranzo a lot and I marry it with a purse with four coins in it, right? Matching purse with four coins in it. Um, that, that is set up just specifically for that, for that sequence. So I have that together so that if I want to do that, I just pick it up and I'm good to go. Um, I have all my coin boxes and everything and, 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 and sundry gimmicks like holes for the David Ross portable hole routine and different sizes of, um, um, uh, purse frames and various different Akito boxes and Boston boxes and uh, Duivia boxes and stuff like that. I have all of this stuff in these four pill uh, in these four massive sort of trays. Uh, and then I have another one, uh, which, which is slightly smaller and that's all of my jumbo coins and jumbo coin gimmicks and uh, all the different things because I have a lot of jumbo coin gimmicks. So all of that is put together, right? Um, when I'm going to a gig, what I do is, it's a little bit like Batman. <laughs> which sounds ridiculous, but you know when Batman goes in the Batcave, he might not take everything that he needs straight away. He picks what he needs based on the mission he's got. So he might not, right, I'm gonna take my Batarang, I'm gonna take my smoke tablets, I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna take that. Right, put those in the utility belt, I'm ready to go. Well, it's the same with me. I'm not gonna take my entire coin collection to each gig, but I'll, I'll pick. So before I do a gig, I'll probably go, okay, um, if it's an important gig, I'm not gonna try something new. So I'd probably take, right, okay, I'm gonna take this, and I'm gonna take this, and I'm gonna take 
take this. If it's a walk around gig, I might take this, this and this. If it's a gig where I'm outside in a festival, I might take cheaper coins. I've got cheaper sets and more expensive sets. If I'm doing an outside festival, I might take cheaper sets because I've had it in the past where I've dropped a coin, it's gone on the floor and I've lost it. And oh my God, that's terrible. So I might take a cheaper set to a festival. When I used to do restaurants, I don't really do restaurants as much anymore. But when I used to do restaurants, I remember once, um, I had a, a 3CM, I've got a few of them, a 3CM or a triple throat, right? Very expensive coin. And I was doing this whole full beautiful routine to a table of four people. And there was a, like a 10 year old kid there. And at the end of the routine, he just reached over and grabbed the coin off me and threw it to the other side of the uh, the restaurant. And it was packed and I couldn't find it. And, and it absolutely killed me. So when I did restaurants after that, I took the cheap gimmicks. <laughs> you know, I didn't take the really expensive stuff. Um, and then if it's, if, if it's a gig, that's maybe not as important uh like I'm, uh, I'm i'm booked to do something i've done a million times or whatever and i feel like i can work some new material in uh that's what i'll do i'll take that with me uh i'll take if i'm working on a new routine i'll take the stuff that i need to do that new routine so i can work it in i'd never work in a new routine in a in a in a, in a, in a like a really important gig where i really have to smash it um, so yeah, that's what I do. And then when I come back from my gig, everything goes back into the relevant section. I'm not as organized as this with everything. I'm not as organized with this, with almost anything else. I've got playing cards everywhere and I have no idea where, what, what's in them or what's special about. No idea. I, I, no, literally no idea. But when it comes to coins, I'm very organized. Right, so the next question is by Ben Jones, and Ben says, what's your new everyday carry magic wallet, FPS wallet, or the 1914 shadow wallet? You know what, man? I don't know, because I haven't left the house since December. I, I had a couple of gigs in December. Uh, I haven't left the house since Christmas Day. Um, I've got a, 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 I just haven't, you know, I've got, I've got, I ha other than going to the office a few times, literally to the office and back, I haven't left the house. So I haven't needed an everyday carry. And that's actually a question I've asked myself a few times. I don't know. I love them both for different reasons. I love the FPS wallet because I think that the, the load, I, I just think it's the best card in wallet I've ever seen. And I'm definitely going to be upgrading my, uh, my uh, to the FPS wallet when I go out and do gigs, which is going to allow, I love it. I love, I love the fact I can load it from my pocket, but I also love the fact that I can put it down on the table and load it from the table. Absolutely brilliant. Um, however, if I don't have a deck of cards with me, it's kind of a little bit useless. Whilst what I like about the shadow wallet is I can put my money in there, I can put my cards in there. I've got it set up to do this killer thought of card routine, but I've also got it set up so I can do a peek. So as long as I've got three or four business cards in there, I'm good to go. And the nice thing I like about both of them is they're designed as an everyday wallet. And what I mean by that is you look at some wallets and it's not really designed as an everyday wallet. You can't put your money in there. You can't put your cash in there. You can't put your cards in there. Uh, there's just no space. It's designed as a magic wallet. Both of these wallets are designed to put your stuff in that you would carry around with you on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, I love them both. I'm leaning, as I say, until I actually go out and actually start leaving the house again, I can't really tell you for sure. I'm leaning towards the shadow wallet just because I don't need to carry a pack of cards around with me. And I can just literally have some business cards in there. And even if I haven't got business cards, I can still do the thought of card routine. Whilst with the FPS wallet, I'm going to need... I'm going to need a deck of cards with me. And sometimes I don't remember to take a pack of cards out with me. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm leaning towards Shadow Wallet. But both of those wallets are going to be gigging with me from now on. Uh, those are going to be my two wallets that I gig with. Because, oh my gosh, they are both so strong. Stevie Seltzer Moves is the next person to ask a question. Hey, Stevie, how you doing? Hope you're well. Um, am I right in thinking I saw you once on the Cruise Channel? Yes, with hair many, many years ago, uh, when I first, not when I first, but very early on in my stage career, when I set up, uh, when I was doing um, an illusion show right early in the early days, I was working with a guy called Russell Leeds, which some of you might know. He puts out some great rubber band DVDs. And he was the guy who I originally set up the, uh, the, the illusion show with. And we were doing everything to get as much publicity for the show as possible. And we got invited because we'd done some cruises. We got invited to go on Cruising with the Stars, which is a great opportunity. And uh, we both went on there. Um, I've still got the footage, I think, somewhere. He did, uh, what did Russell do? He did uh, 
Garrett Thomas's Stand Up Monty, I did Card to Phone because I absolutely love Card to Phone. And that's how I remember how long ago it was because I remember having a really old iPhone and there was a picture of Ryland on there as a baby. And I remember it was just after Ryland was born. Ryland was born in November. So it probably would have been, it probably would have been January 2000 and... 13. It probably would have been January 2013, about three months after he was born. So it was a very long time ago, probably almost 10 years ago. But yeah, I was on Cruising with the Stars. In fact, somewhere on this channel, there's a video of me performing on Cruising with the Stars. So yeah, um, that was me. I had hair. I was thinner. I had glasses. I had no stubble. I was wearing a suit, but it was me. Okay, so the next question is by Andy uh, Tingley. <laughs> hey, Andy, what are you doing? Uh, why are there card tricks I learnt in the 70s and 80s by books, no internet them days, but are being released as downloads and packet tricks? Are people too lazy to read nowadays, e.g. learn one trick, $15, or a good old-fashioned book like World Road to Card Magic, $9.99? Uh, many tricks. It seems weird nowadays. I remember what I learnt in the late 70s and early 80s. I could be a very rich old man. What do you think, Craig? I, I, completely, agree. I completely agree with you, Andy. I think that the problem is... Um, people these days are looking for instant gratification. And what I mean by that is, um, so I'll give, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. Um, a routine that I've seen recently as a download on Penguin Magic is Close Up Illusion, um, uh, which is the trick where you've got like two blue cards and a red card, and you put the red card at the bottom and you shake it and it visually comes through into the middle, and then you have it in the middle and you shake it and it comes down to the bottom. Uh, it's a great trick, right? And they're selling it for like a $10 download or a $15 download, and it's always in the top position on the download. So people are buying it and they're buying a lot of them. Um, and I don't blame uh, but, you know, Penguin have obviously not just put, they've got the rights to put this out, obviously. They wouldn't just rip somebody off and put it off, um, put it out. So they've got the rights, and I don't blame them for putting it out because, obviously, by the fact that it's always in the top 10, people are buying it. The fact of the matter is, you can get that along with another 15 tricks on Michael Amar's Easy to Master Card Magic series, right? But a lot of people, they tend not to bother. It's like, uh, and it, it is instant gratification. It's like I see people at, let's talk about Blackpool Magic Convention, for example. I'll see people at Blackpool Magic Convention and there'll be a guy, like Paul Gordon, for example. There'll be a guy like Paul Gordon that's basically got a stack of books and he's performing routines out of these books. And, and it's killer material. It's really good material. And people are walking by and some people might be buying the books. But you know what? They're probably going to be more likely to buy the gimmick that's twice as much as the book. Um, because then you can say, well, you know, hey, let me show you this. Oh, and it's really easy. It's just this flap and all you have to do is you just do this. And it, it opens up the flap and it does itself. People can see themselves doing that immediately. They know if they're going to do Paul's material, for example, from a book, it's going to take time. It's going to take practice. It's going to take effort. And a lot of the time when people go to conventions, they're looking for a new toy that they can play with. They probably realize that it's going to go into their bottom drawer, but they don't care. They want the toy. They've made up in their mind that they're going to make a, spend a certain amount of money and they want to spend money on a toy. And that's the way it is. But it's the same online as well. Um, you could, you could um, put a... The problem with the, the, the close-up illusion is a perfect example. It makes a killer trailer. Watch this card <sighs> rise up and you've got people screaming and you've got reactions. Everybody's going to want to buy it, especially when it's a cheaper price. The fact that you can get it on another product, people don't care. They want that 10-minute download to be able to do that trick straight away. It's instant gratification. Now, I'm not saying that new magicians or old magicians or any type of magician doesn't like to practice, but I'm seeing it a lot these days where a lot of magicians, because of the pandemic, how many times have you heard on an internet forum or on a Facebook group a magician going, ah, oh, I haven't picked up a pack of cards in a year. I haven't picked up a pack of cards in a year or I haven't picked up a pack of cards in six months. I've been practicing more now than ever before. I love doing this stuff. I love practicing, right? I absolutely love practicing. I practice all of the time. Ryland practices all of the time. Um, I'm, you know, one of the few advantages of the pandemic is I'm having more time to practice because pre-COVID, I was running around the country doing gigs and I didn't really have as much time to practice. Now I have, and I've learned so much new material and I've learned that I've created so many new things that I've been wanting to sit down and do for a long time. Um, 
And, and there's other magicians that are like that. I know there are. I know there's magicians out there that are like that. But there's also magicians that just kind of lost the mojo a little bit. And it's a shame. It really is. But it comes down to, uh, it, you know, to get back on topic, it's, in it's instant gratification. And it's always going to be the same. It's in this day and age, uh, people will more likely buy um, a standalone product with a gimmick than they will uh, a set of DVDs with 15 routines with no gimmicks. Why do you think you don't see as many projects like that anymore? Think about all the new stuff that comes out. What you see these days is you say, hey, there's this trick that's come out and it's got, it takes Summit, for example. Hey, it's this amazing Sharpie and it's this amazing gimmick and it's this and that and the other. Um, look, at, look at all of the tricks that have come out recently. It's always this special gimmick and it's always that when you package a trick with a special gimmick, people want to buy the gimmick. They want to play around with the gimmick. If you put out a DVD set with 15 tricks with regular pack of cards, people will buy them, but less people will buy them. They want that trick they want that instant gratification and unfortunately i don't think there's anything we can do about that it's just the way things are these days it's it's just the way people are you know for, you know i'm not going to get into marketing or consumer um behavior and stuff like that but i think that's the way it's going to be for a while unfortunately but the advantage is the people like you the old farts like you and like me that know all of the old material you know that it's it's the old expression isn't it the best way to hide a secret is to publish it in a book you know because hardly anyone reads it or if they do they'll skim over it okay so um there's been several comments on last week's q a asking about uh summit and about the prop dog um uh trailer honest trailer and what i think of it and i think they did a great job of the honest trailer and i i, I it's one of the reasons i love prop dog they are not afraid dave bonsall and the team of prop dog are not afraid to call people out for doing something that they don't think is ethical and i think that's absolutely great now summit I have reviewed it. It went up on Wednesday. Me and Ryan reviewed it. I didn't like it. I was a bit torn because the gimmicks are actually really good for uh, a sort of a signed card in Sharpie, which is, I think, the way that I would use the gimmicks. Um, but the trick in itself, I don't think is a great trick, to be perfectly honest. I really don't think it's a great trick. Uh, so lots of people have asked that on last week's Q&A. If you haven't seen the review show, go check out the review show because me and Ryan go totally in depth as to what we think of the trick. Okay, so the final question is by Brent Barry. How you doing, Brent Barry? I hope you're okay. And the question is, uh, rising card, what is your favourite rising card? Well, I'm, I'm not telling you. Um, <laughs> only because, I will tell you, but I'm doing a, uh, you know my three trick series that I do on a Thursday? Every other Thursday I do three tricks with this, three tricks with that, three tricks with the other. Well, very, very soon I'm doing three tricks Three rising card tricks that you've probably never seen before. And uh, I'm going to be talking about rising card because there's so many different ways of doing rising card. My favourite rising card and the one, that I don't, the one that I do more than anything else is Uprising by Richard Sanders. Now, if you go on YouTube and you type in Wizard Product Review Uprising Richard Sanders Craig Petty, you will see me reviewing this product from 2014. Um, me and Dave Penn reviewed uh, Uprising and I gave it a great review and I said that I absolutely loved it and he gave it a, a bad review and he said that it wasn't as good as other rising cards on the market. And, and he told me at the time I, I wouldn't use it. Well, you know what? Fast forward eight years, seven years or whatever it is. And I use that in my gigging, day-to-day -day gigging situation more than I do any other product. And the reason I do is because it just uses a regular pack of cards. So Uprising just uses a regular pack of cards. There's no extras. There's no gimmicks. Now, you can use a... Um, you can use a, uh, a handkerchief to do uprising, and I tend not to do a handkerchief. Um, I tend not to use a handkerchief. I think it looks a bit too magic-y for me, and I think it looks a little bit more pure if you just use it as a, uh, as a, as a, as a regular pack of cards. But, you know, there's so many different ways of doing um, rising card, and I've seen so many over the years, and there's some great ones, and I'm going to be doing a couple of videos, as I say, very, very soon, highlighting some of these. Uh, but they all require gimmicks. You know, Kundalini Rising by Jeff McBride is something that people talk about all the time, but you need the gimmick with you. It may be a regular pack of cards, but you need the gimmick with you. And if you haven't got the gimmick, you can't do the trick. There's some really clever gimmick decks, but they require the gimmick deck. Um, you have Henry Heavens has got an amazing rising card, but again, it requires 
requires a special card. Uh, it may just be one special card, but if you haven't got that card with you, you can't do it. There's some electronic versions which are amazing. There's so many different uh, versions which are absolutely fantastic. I'm going to be touching on some of these in future videos. But for me, and I'm, uh, Uprising is great because you can have three people pick cards from three different parts of the uh, three different cards. They put them back in the deck. And, and then one at a time, the cards will rise out the deck. It's that clean. Regular deck of cards, anytime, anywhere. And if you see my parlor DVD, you'll know that I've used that principle in a couple of other routines. So I've got this really cool routine that I published on parlor. And if you want me to do it on a magic live, just say the word and I will, where three people pick cards and I say, I'm gonna make, make each one of them rise in a different way. And the first one I use um, Uprising. Then the second phase, I have, uh, I do a, uh, a something by Sean McCree where the, the, uh, it rises up visibly, but it's folded up in the middle. And the third way um, I do it is I, I make the entire deck disappear and one card rises up. One card rises out of the deck and then the entire deck disappears. And it, it's on parlor. Um, I'm not going to perform a whole uprising thing now. I'm not going to use three cards, but just to give you an example, uh, you would say stop. We'll just do it with one card. Look out for the video. It's probably coming up on the magic stuff in the next week or two. But, uh, and I'll show you the whole thing with three cards and I'll go into depth as to why it's good and why it's not so good. Uh, but with one card, What's nice about this is you literally have the card there and you can uh, you can literally just have it rise up and, uh, and and it just rises up and that's the card. And what you can do if you want to is you can then go and get a color change. I mean, there's so many different ways of doing it. There really is. So we've got the three of cubs uh, and I'm just using one card now, but you can have more than one card. So there you go. There's the, uh, the three of clubs and you see it rising out the deck. There you go. You see it rising out the deck from the middle of the deck, you can immediately give the cards out. So for me, that's the best rising card. Anyone else perform rise? So, you know, I'm gonna say right now to David Penn, seven years on, I love you, buddy, but you were completely wrong on this one. Uprising is absolutely amazing. Um, but let me know in the comments down below, do you do Uprising? Do you do Richard Sanders Uprising? I'd love to know what you think. Okay, so there is one final question. Um, and the final question has been, I, I've seen it dotted around on various videos and a lot of people have said to me, what do I think of Justin Flom? Have you seen his latest video? And I've talked about Justin Flom on this channel over and over and over and over again. So I don't want to spend hardly any time on this. But for those of you that don't know, he's exposed magic again. Because what he's done is he's taken the astonishing bottle, um, which is an amazing trick. It's an amazing trick. It's, it's, it's the... Um, uh, Miranda Astonishing Bottle, which is where a bottle of Fanta turns into a bottle of Pepsi or a bottle of Coke, and he's exposed it. He he shoves a hot dog in there. He shows how it works and, and so on and so forth. Um, and he does it in the context of a prank. So it's just a prank. He's used this trick uh, to, to do this prank video. Um, what do I think of that? Well, I had a very good friend of mine who is also an exceptional close-up magician. His name is Roman Armstrong. And by the way, if you haven't seen Roman perform, please do so. And also, by the way, talking about Roman Armstrong, if you haven't seen, he, many, many years ago, he went to World Magic Shop and he did a, like a pilot show as part of his university course, like a pilot show for a, for like a magic themed sitcom. And it is the best thing I've ever seen. If it's on YouTube, I'll link it. I think it is somewhere. It is hilarious. That thing should have been picked up as a pilot show because it is brilliant. It is absolutely brilliant. Anyway, Roman's an amazing magician and he messaged me and said, this is terrible. I do this in my acts all the time. I do it on my virtual shows all the time. And Roman's right, man. This is absolutely terrible. Um, you know, John Archer did this on BGT. Uh, and I've had, I, I, I was discussing this with somebody recently and somebody said to me, well, you know, it's not too much of a problem because uh, he's not doing it the same way that Miranda does it. So people won't make the creative leap. And I honestly think that people will make the creative leap. I think that people will say, hang on a minute. Um, I, I, I think we need to treat laymen with a little bit of intelligence. And I think they will actually be able to put two and two together. I do think that anybody who watches this video, within a few days, they're going to completely forget about seeing it and they'll move on. And I think if you performed it to people, if you perform this uh, astonishing bottle, a week later, people would forget of what they've seen Justin Flom do. 
But that's not the point. The point is he's going out exposing magic again and not even in a clever way. He's just literally, it's not like he's um, doing a tutorial where he's teaching people how to do magic for the good of magic. He's literally just um, exposing it on a prank video. People have got no interest in learning magic. They're watching this prank video and they're getting an exposure of this bottle trick. And uh, it's terrible, it really is. And, and uh, go and look at the Bizarro interview that I did with Bizarro. He talks about this in great detail. The best thing that we can do with Justin Flom is not watch his videos, not comment on his videos, not interact with his videos. He's doing this stuff because it, it, it's all about the almighty dollar, unfortunately. He wants to make money and he's making a lot of money from doing these videos. If people stopped watching the videos and he would stop getting paid, then he'd start to worry. The best way to deal with this is cut him off uh, where he cares about the most. And honestly, I think this guy at this point cares more about money than he does about anything else. And definitely he cares more about money than he does about magic. So I think the best thing is to just not comment on it um, and, and just understand that unfortunately, Justin Flom has turned his back on magic. It's more about money now than it is about magic. He doesn't care, and that just shows the type of person that he is. He's made his choice, now he needs to live with it. And unfortunately, and I tell you this from personal experience, when you piss off the magic community, it's a very long, hard slog to get back into a position where they actually trust you and uh, and respect you again and unfortunately if he ever does want to come back into magic he's got a very long hill that he needs to climb because what he's done right now is unforgivable so there you go that's another q a in the bag as ryland would say let me know in the comments down below what you think and please these q a's uh, I love doing them. They are only as good as the questions that you ask. So there is nothing off the table. You can ask me anything and I will answer it to the best of my ability. Any questions you've got, leave them down below. And I hope you have an amazing Sunday. If you're watching this when it goes up, have a great Sunday. Thank you very much for watching. I'm going to be back again soon uh, tomorrow with a uh, with a 5x5. Five five. So I'll see you then. Thanks for watching. My name's Craig from Magic TV.